game is dealing with the sin of partiality, you might consider that the sin of bias or prejudice. And uh, he illustrated a problem that was occurring within the first century church in their assembly hour and visitors, how they were handling visitors. And they were showing partiality to visitors that came uh, by where they sat uh, and was developing a class system within the church, which is not acceptable. Galatians, the third chapter, verses 26 through 28, remind us that that entire system uh, God is no respecter of persons, and we shouldn't be either. When Christ died on the cross, he died for everybody. Everybody comes into the kingdom the same way. They come by faith through grace and not of themselves as a gift of God. And as a result of that, the equality is found in Christ. Now, in the human realm, of course, there are classes. People are prejudiced. But in the church, that's not so. It should not be so. It's unacceptable. And so James has been talking about that. Now he continues his argument in verse 8 and 9. So let's look at verse 8 and 9. If, however, the translation of however is kind of interesting. It doesn't do it justice, however. If, however, but it is a reference back. And the, the argument in verses 1 through 7 is continuing, however, right? It gives you kind of a heads up that this is an extension of what has been discussed. But translation, however, is not really good in the Greek language. And you'll see it in a moment. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal love, the royal law, according to the scriptures, and he's now going to quote Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says you're doing well. Notice that word if. That's a first class condition. Then in verse 9. But if. That's a first class condition. One of the things that's important for you to understand. That at the end of verse 9. There is no period. Now in your Bible. You probably have a period. But in the original text, you have a semicolon. You have a semicolon. And, at the end, and in the Greek language, at the end of the word scripture, it's not a semicolon, it's a colon. And at the end of verse 8, it's a semicolon. In other words, verse 8 and verse 9 is one Greek sentence. And it's very important. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal love according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. The royal law of the, of the, the royal law is the law of love. For then verse 9, but if you show partiality, like it was in verses illustrated in verses 1 through 7. You are committing sin, and you are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Now, James in verse 10 is going to tell you what that means. As a transgressor, to violate one part of the law is to be guilty of it all. But we'll talk about that at another day. And so we have as our subject matter the royal law of love. Let's open with a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest indwelt by the Holy Spirit to confess sin if necessary. And it would be because the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't study it nor apply it in carnality. Evidence of carnality, i.e. flesh, is personal sin. It could be mental attitude, it could be sin of the tongue, it could be overt sins. At least in those three categories, we're of interest today. And how do we recover from carnality is confession of sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, 
he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. You should not wait till Sunday to do that. You should not wait to the end of the day to do that. You should do that whenever you're aware and convicted by the Holy Spirit of sin in your life, you should confess it then. So I give you a moment. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, restore us to spirituality, which is the key for Bible study and the faith system. So our Father, we're thank you, thankful today for these that have come our way by automobile and by internet. We pray the Holy Spirit uh, would once again minister the truth that sets us free from the cosmic system of lies. John 8, the devil is a liar. He can never tell the truth. And when he does, it's always to twist it, distort it, pervert it, to get people to do his will and not God's. And so, our Father, we're thankful we come to represent the truth of the word of God today. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a couple of things that would be of great interest to other than the fact that I said this is one Greek sentence, not two. In your Greek Bible, you could see that clearly. The other fact is there's two first-class conditions. The word if. Now, in the English, you just have if, and you have to pay attention to what if is. But in the Greek language, it identifies what kind of an if, and there are four ifs in the Greek language. This is a first-class condition, and it means it's true. A Greek sentence has an if clause and a then clause. We call that the protasis and the apotasis, the protasis being the first if. If it's true in the if clause, then it's true in the then clause. That's a first class condition. That's very important for us when we interpret this. So we have it, we have two of these in one sentence. We have two in one sentence. Okay? There's, there's a pretty big deal here. We have one in verse 8 and one in verse 9. The second thing that you cannot see that's very important in the Greek language. Verse 8 begins with, it has, verse 8 and 9 has a mende sequence. Mende sequence. This is really important in the Greek language. And good writers in the, in the New Covenant, under the Greek language, New Covenant writers are really good at showing you this. And it's a big deal. We have the men clause in verse 8, and the day clause, M-E-N in the first, the, the first first class condition, and the day, D-E clause in verse 9, with that if. Now, let me tell you why this is important. Because men should be translated on the one hand, and the day clause should be translated on the other hand. But on the other hand. On the one hand, but on the other hand. That's how that's translated. But, uh, uh, but on the one hand, but on the other hand. Now let's read it. Here's how it should read. On the one hand, that's the man, m m main, men, M-E-N. On the one hand, if... You can forget however, because they were trying to tell you that with the word however. On the one hand, if you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, and he quotes Leviticus 19.18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That Here's the then clause. This is true. If that's true, this is true. Then you are doing very well. Then you are doing well. Semicolon. You have a colon after the word scripture because a colon is given in the English language to give a quotation, to give a further explanation. It's a very important deal in the English language, a colon. You don't pay that much attention to it, I suppose, but it's a big deal. It's also a big deal in the Greek. And so when you have the colon uh, here, it's used in a classic example, scripture colon, and then gives you a quotation this quotation 
has everything to do with the meaning of what the writer is talking about. And he's quoting Leviticus 19.18. Okay? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And, of course, the key word is love. And the key word is neighbor. You're to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay? So that's the, that's the first part of this. That's the first part. Then he comes to verse 9, which is an extension of the thinking of verse 8. And we have the day sequence, D-E. On the other hand, if, first class condition, true, you show partiality, you are committing sin and convicted by the law as a transgressor. In other words, there's your then. Watch this now. On the one hand, if you show partiality, then you are, then you are committing sin and convicted by the law as a transgressor. Convicted by the law as a transgressor. So what you have is really interesting here. In verse 8, you have a positive idea. In verse 9, you have a negative. About partiality. James says the answer to partiality is the love of God manifested from us to other people. Not, the, not partiality, but God's love. The love that God showed towards us when he sent his Christ, when he sent his son Christ to die on the cross who showed his love for the Father to, the, to humanity. God shows his love for humanity by sending his son. That's why the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. Do you think there's another way? And listen, and the only way to God through Christ is to believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. And when you believe that, you were saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. I meet a lot of people who believe the message of the gospel but distort the mechanics of it. You've got to believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. But you have to be saved by believing that and you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. You add nothing to the work of Christ on the cross. It's a big issue. It's a big issue. It divided the Christian church and still does today. Law, law works versus believing faith, grace. For by grace I say through faith. That's a big deal. And you've got to have both parts of this salvation message right. You've got to have the message right and the mechanics right. A lot of people, quote, preach the gospel that don't preach the gospel. So we have a positive and we have a negative. One of the things about verse 8 that closes, that verse closes with a semicolon, is to remember that a semicolon is used to coordinate a major element, to coordinate major elements of the sentence. See, a lot of times we forget that stuff, don't we? I mean, when's the last time we really studied English? It's a key to the Greek language for sure as it's translated into English, and they sure missed it in this text. And this is really a big, this is, this is big stuff. So let me talk about five things or as many as I can get through today. Number one, James' spiritual solution, his spiritual solution to the sin of partiality is the royal law of love, and he quotes Leviticus 19.18. You know why he quotes it? Because that's the only Bible he has. The New Testament has not been completed. We only, he only has... Half a canon. 
He can't, he can't quote Paul. He can't quote Galatians. He can't quote Romans. He quotes from his Bible the scriptural truth. In this transitional period from the Old Covenant to New Covenant, we do not have a new, we don't have a New Testament. He's writing, in fact, he's writing the first book. Somewhere around 45. So he, he, he's proof texting. He says, the royal law. Do you know why it's a royal law? Because of Jesus Christ. It comes through the Davidic reign. He's the king of the kingdom, is he not? <laughs> you know where he got that from? His Bible, which was the Old Testament. You know where they get their gospel? according to the scripture, from the Old Testament. This is why it took them a long time. Listen, you preach the gospel. It takes no time for us to preach a gospel today. You should read Acts 2 and see how long it took them to explain the gospel from the Old Covenant viewpoint. See, we will forget that James' Bible was Old Covenant and it was a Septuagint. The Greek translation of it. Of course, we've reminded you a great deal about that. So his spiritual solution to the sin of partiality in his Bible, he quotes Leviticus 19.18, the royal law of love, royal because of Christ, law because it's Leviticus, and love because God established it for the new covenant. While love was an issue in the old covenant, it is supreme in the new covenant. Right? I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't know John 3.16, right? Who doesn't know that? I mean, just about everybody. It's amazing to me that little kids can learn that verse like that. I mean, it's kind of a long verse, ain't it? Something like 25 words. It amazes me. Uh, two, three-year-old kids memorize that verse. I got them in my family. They memorize that verse. They love it. Then they sing, Jesus loves me. Little Ev, two years old, she's got the most compassionate heart. If she sees somebody crying in a store or any place, she wants to get to them and sing, Jesus loves them. Yeah, she's saying, she wants it. She, she's not going to be content unless her mother takes her over there. And she puts her little hand on him and sings, Jesus loves you. Wouldn't it be good if we had that compassionate, that tender hearted in our lives to reach over and see somebody. And listen, she can pick them out. Walking through the store, you and I pass them right by. She can pick them out. They're, they're troubled people. It's pretty amazing to me. That's called parenting. But I'm just saying that little kids pick this stuff up. Uh, and use it in just a phenomenal way. And they're just little kids. I mean, they're not, the Holy Spirit's not working in their life like yours and mine and all that. But they don't have all those censorships either, do they? Well, I better not disturb them. I better not do this. They just go up, put their hand on them, and say, Jesus loves you. This I know for the, you know. I know your children do it too, but I, I don't know yours as well as I know mine, so. So, you might say to James, when James lays this out to you, the spiritual solution, you should love your neighbor as yourself, you might say back to James, I hear you, James, but I am one of those who have a problem with respect to persons. I know that I'm biased. I know that I'm prejudiced towards some people. I know that. And they might explain it as a man did to me the other day. It was the way I was raised. I understand that too. My question back to him was, have you ever been born again? And let me tell you what I mean by born again. I don't wait for an answer. Let me tell you what I mean by that. And I go through the gospel presentation. Do you believe that as a source of your absolute 100% salvation? Then I go to the second question. Because that may be a fair, a fair question from the world. 
look, yeah, I'm prejudiced. I know I'm prejudiced. It's the way I was raised. I, I am prejudiced towards certain people. It's the way I was raised. I understand that. I understand that. My people were really strong on us not to be prejudiced towards other people and other situations. I'm, 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 my people were really tough on us over it. But a lot of people aren't. I understand that. But listen, if you've been born again, then let's get rid of that deal. I'm going to show you how to have the power to get rid of that. You don't have to. That, now it's an excuse. Now you're blaming your bad behavior. If you've been born again, you have a power in you that can overcome all that. That's not acceptable. I understand your argument, and I understand how you came to that place in your life to be prejudiced, but that don't fly anymore. That don't fly anymore. And so we make excuses. We use blame for bad behavior, we ignoring a conscious need for change. I mean, every time a guy hears a sermon like this, if he has that in him, the Spirit convicts him of it. The Old Testament convicts him of it. <laughs> Think about that. That's a whole different word, you know. The law convicts you, calls you a transgressor. The Holy Spirit convicts you and says, confess your sin. You're still part of the program. Let's get on with God's program in your life instead of your own. Let's get into his agenda and not in his agenda, not in your own. It's a whole different ballgame. A whole different ballgame. I don't know about your life, but it should be a different ballgame. Every time we hear it, we have a conscious need in our life. We say, boy, I need to make some changes in my life in regard to that. But we don't. Yet we know in our hearts that God is no respecter of person. And let me tell you, it's very, let me tell you now, I'm not being critical. Listen to me. It's very difficult to get rid of stuff like this. Oh, yeah, now listen to me. Peter got saved in Acts 2. His life got transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and his awareness of it. Agreed? Oh, yeah, come on. Do you know that he struggles with the law all the way to Acts 10 and 11? I mean, really struggles. He's not willing to go to people who are positive to open, open to the gospel because they're of the, they're of the, wrong, they're the wrong people. And God has to do an, a vision from heaven with the sheet coming down and all that business with Cornelius to get him out of that. And even after Acts 10 and 11, he is still struggle, struggling with it all the way to Galatians. There are some things in your life, even after you've been born again and transformed and into the power system that God has by walking by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, there are issues in your life that need to be conquered by God's powerful grace system that you're not permitting. And we tell you that that's called taking off the old and putting on the new, and you push back on us. And what are you going to do with Peter? What are you going to do with Peter? What are you going to do with James, who is really struggling with that same issue? And you want to know how bad James struggled when he's writing on this? You should read Acts 21 and see what he convinced Paul theologically to do. There are some issues in your life that have a hold on you. And you know in your conscious mind, conv convinced by the Word of God, convicted by the Holy Spirit, on issues that, well, you know, people used to, when I grew up, people would say, well, you know why she has a bad temper? She's a redhead. How do you know that, I would say? They change their hair every day. What are you talking about? 
what you going to say if she comes with a blonde and has that same attitude? Because that woman that has red hair today could have blonde hair tomorrow or black or brown or, or, or shave it off. What you going to do with bald-headed women? Oh, where people get all that foolishness. Where they get that? We know where that stuff comes from. It ain't your hair. It's your heart. You know what? You know what God told Peter in Acts the tenth chapter, verse thirty-four and thirty-five. Listen to what he said. Peter, when Peter pushed back against God, can you imagine that? See. Us, we stand up here and preach to we You push back on us because we're just mere men. But he pushed back on God. And God says, hey, what are you doing? I'm no respecter of persons. He pushed him back on God. You are too. You do know that when you push back on the word of God, you're pushing back on the character of God. What are you going to do with it, though? I'll tell you what you need. You need to exchange it. It's a worn-out pair of shoes. Get you a new pair. Get you a new pair. In Romans, the seventh chapter, 14 through 25, Paul suggests this to the guy who says, every time I hear a sermon like this, I know I have need for change, but I just can't seem to do it. And then he blames everybody around him. Listen to what Paul said in the seventh chapter of Romans, verse 15. He says, here is your dilemma. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. I am doing the very thing I hate. There's a person that knows the right thing to do, doesn't do it, and has a guilty conscience when he goes against what he knows he should have done and couldn't do it, didn't want to do it, was unwilling to do it, went ahead and had their say, had my day in court, take it, like it, or hit the road. Who are you? Who are you that you think you can have this kind of re re responsibility? How, how is that possible that you think you have that much of liberty? Or maybe in the 7th chapter, verse 23 of Romans 7, I'm trying to tease you to read the whole thing. I see a different law, he writes. I see a different law. Oh, I see a different law in the members of my body. Waging war against the law of my mind. What is that law working in my body by the members of my body? My hands, my feet, my eyes, my ears, my feet, whatever. What is that law that is at war in my body against my mind? Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Who is at war with my mind in Christ Jesus? What is the, what is the law? That's what, listen to what he says. He says, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin. How about that? And where is that identified? Who is that identified within me? My flesh. My nature to sin. So we call it a sin nature. Part of my flesh. That's at war. Paul says this in Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the desires, the lust of the flesh. They are in opposition to one another. They are waging war against one another within you. And let me tell you, you'll feed one of those dogs. You feed them. You feed them. You have to decide. You have to, you have to, decide who you're going to exchange. You're going to live in the flesh or live in the spirit. You're going to walk by sight or you're going to walk by faith. These are all choices you make. And, and listen, they're made every day 
And it depends how your day goes. Don't you know that? I can tell you. I just talk with you one or two times a day. I can tell you how your day's going to go. I hear people say, my day sucks. <laughs> well, I wonder, I wonder who could be the cause of that. Well, if you had my job, if you knew my boss, if you had my difficulty, oh, yeah, right, like nobody else has that. The only person that get, makes a good day that God gives you, God gives you every day, gives you a good day. The only person that can change that is you. So stop blaming everything else about it. See, I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Listen to what he says in verse 25 of Romans 7. So then, on the one hand and on the other hand, guess what that is? That's a Mende sequence. I wrote it down for you because you'll miss it. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. But on the other hand, with my flesh... The law of sin. You see the warfare? Then get it under control. Because you know who controls that? Volition. Free will does it. Stop blaming. Well, if you know, if I wasn't married, I'd have a dollar in my pants. If, if I wasn't this, I would have that. If I was that, 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 that. And listen. You're not blaming. Sometimes you sit around and blame yourself. All that blaming to get you nowhere. Where does that get you? And don't you know all that's flesh? All that's flesh. Where's the victory in Jesus? You walk in the power of the Spirit, not in the weakness of the flesh. The flesh is weak. The spirit is strong. You can never walk in the flesh and win. Come on, prodigal son. You can never do that in a million years. Flesh is weak. That's why, it, that's why Satan uses it. The spirit is strong. It has power over the flesh. You choose which dog you're going to feed. You choose which dog you're going to feed. Who are you kidding? Here's the second point. Paul gave the spiritual solution to the law of sin and death. James doesn't. He gives the spiritual solution to the law of sin and death in the 8th chapter of Romans as the law of the spirit of life. He says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Depends on who I feed. I've been set free. Galatians, the first chapter, and the third, uh, fifth chapter, verse 1 and verse 13. Set free. Christ has set me free. I am free indeed. Why don't you live as free men? Live in the power of the Spirit. Live by faith. Don't live in the flesh. Don't live by sight. These are choices. Can't, don't be blaming nobody. Step to the plate and take responsibility for your life. Turn it over to God who knows he's got it all planned out. He's got it all mapped out. But you got to know mechanics. You got to know mechanics. You can go, oh, all that craziness. Sit around and cry for a half a day. It's not going to solve anything. You emote, you do a little purging, emotional purging, doesn't solve anything. Get right into the Holy Spirit's ministry. Walk in the power of the Spirit. Walk by the power of the Word of God in your life. Quit sitting around and whining.
in Galatians 8, 4. So that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Isn't that interesting? Now, how is that possible? How can Leviticus 19, 18, the requirements of the law, be fulfilled in me, a church-age believer, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Holy Spirit? You know how you apply the love your neighbor as yourself under the new covenant? By walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not fulfilled in the flesh and will power, but by the Holy Spirit power. I didn't make it up. I just read it. The requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. You see, I need to tell you that the devil uses your flesh and my flesh as one way to entrap believers to feel hopeless failures. I hear, I'm not a good mother. I don't think I'll ever be one. I'm not a good wife. I don't think I'll ever be one. I'm not a good husband. I don't think I'll ever be one. I don't... Jeez. It's called counseling with a pastor. I mean, how many times do we have to go through this in order for you to get the idea that that's not the way it's going to work? You keep making excuses for your failures, and the devil loves it because he keeps you in the trap, the hopelessness of failure. I was sitting in my office the other day, A guy walks up to me, and I could smell his breath 10 feet away. I thought, oh, here we go. And the Spirit of God said to me, do I sense a spirit of partiality here? Because <laughs> I was ready to feed that dog. I went, yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the other side of walking in the spirit. You go like, ta as soon as my nostrils picked up the breath, my mind immediately went to partiality. Ah, oh, jeez. He going to do this, he going to do that. Before I could even get into my little fiddle, the Spirit of God went, ah, I sense the spirit of partiality. Is that possible, Ron? I went, mm, mm, yeah. What are you going to do with it? I said, well, I'm taking my billfold out of my case and putting it in my front pocket. <laughs> do I sense a spirit of partiality, Ron? Yeah, a little bit. How are you going to deal with him? He's now five feet in front of you. Isn't it interesting how fast the Holy Spirit can talk to you? Now, what I don't know. He said, then listen to me. Jesus. Treat him as Jesus. Oh, I don't think that. <laughs> I mean, that's a far stretch here, isn't it? <laughs> Holy Spirit. <laughs> Treat him as Jesus, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're unwilling to do that, at least treat him as an angel unaware. 
And so I always have a hard time imagining an angel without underwear. <laughs> See what the Holy Spirit has to deal with? And now he comes up and he asks if he could sit down. I want to say, yes, if I could stand up. <laughs> but I know that I would be chastised, so I didn't do that. I thought to my mind, yes, Jesus, you can sit down. And I'm going to tell you, from that, from that point, we had a wonderful conversation. I tell you this because some of these things about the sin of partiality can come on you unexpectedly. By that, I mean you didn't plan it. All of a sudden, it shows up there, and then you react to that in a certain way. And he goes like, cha-ching. Now, he does that for me because I said I'm open to change. I want what you want for me better than I want for myself. And I've entered into that kind of idea with him that I want radical change. I don't want to be that guy anymore. I do not want to be that guy anymore. I want to be the guy that Christ, I want to be the guy that would be like Christ in, in every get, given situation that would be compassionate, understanding, caring, reach as much as you can in the life of a person for change. <laughs> and this is what you get. <laughs> and it's okay. Because I'm better for it. I walked away with a testimony on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. That I wouldn't have had I stayed in my own position of partiality. I mean, be sensitive to walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you have this stuff surface in you, shut it down. You have the power. You don't, it depends on which dog you want to feed. I just have made up my mind I want to feed the good one. I don't want the dog. I don't want to feed the dog that get once more and eats my whole arm off. Because <laughs> that's the dog called the flesh. You never give him enough. First, that cute little dog you had that was so cute is now because, looks like a horse. In the story of the prodigal son, you can really see how the devil uses this stuff. In 2 Timothy 2.26, we need to have a strategy against the snare of the devil. The snare of the devil. See, he always has a snare to catch you in. It looks really good. It looks really good. I mean, you've, you've set traps, haven't you? You got to be smart about the animal you're trapping, don't you? He's really smart about how to trap you. He sets up a trap, a bait system that would attract you to lure you in. Then he'd shut the door on you. I want you to look at that for a moment because as far as I'm going to get in the morning, I'm going to, by the way, I thought that I would probably never get this done. John Dyer said, you're never going to get this done. And I've grown to listen to John once in a while. Should listen to him much more than I do. And so Wednesday night, I'm going to take this subject back up on Wednesday night. Don't give me I'm going to sit home and watch it on television or whatever this is. Don't give me none of that bull. You get your, if you want more of this, you get yourself in here on Wednesday night. I don't listen. 
I got to have live bodies to teach. I'm a live body guy. So don't give me none of this stuff. I'm going to stay home because I'm tired or something. Quit that. That's not, I'm not that guy. I got to have live, I got to have a live audience. <laughs> I could be set up in a morgue. I could, I could do videos, program right out of a morgue. That's not me. Listen to what he says. This is 2 Timothy 2.26. That they may come to their senses. Ooh-wee. That they may come to their senses. See, that's what happened to me the other day. The Spirit of God is, went, oh, spark partiality, huh? Got a little partiality. And I went, eh, uh, oh, eh, uh, uh, uh. Come to your senses. Watch this. And what? And what? You didn't look it up. Are you not in 2 Timothy 2.26? I said, look it up. Maybe, maybe it translates different. I don't know. And they came to their senses and what? And escaped. From what? The snare of the devil. When you get in a snare, the, the trap goes down, right? Back door of some door goes down. And you think, as this man told me the other day, there is no way out. I said, this is your lucky day. There's no way out. I've been in this addictive state. I said, yeah, that's the flesh. Let me, let me suggest trying a new system. The old, that one sure is not working, right? <laughs> well, I, let's try another one. That system's not working. How long, how long have you been working that system? It doesn't work. Are you not open to a new system? No, yeah, I'm wide open for a new system. I'll tell it to you today, and if you want more, you'll have to come back another day when you're sober. But I'll give it to you right now. I'm going to write it on a napkin. You put this napkin in your pocket and come back when you're sober, I'll give you the second half of the story. Listen to this. They came to their senses and escaped. From the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. They came to their senses. They escaped. When we come back Wednesday night, we're going to go to the prodigal son, and I'm going to show you how he did it, the Houdini trick. You know Houdini or Houdini? Houdini. How he did he? I don't know. How did he do that? Come to your senses. Escape the snare of the devil because you're in the snare because he wants you to do his will. So, Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this to our lives. Make it practical. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Make it practical. Reach within us, Father, and pull all of that prejudice and bias and partiality out of us. May we be thankful for it, and may others receive love of a good neighbor. The love of a good neighbor, which is fulfilled in this by the power of the Spirit and not the power of the flesh. To offer somebody hope who has no hope, who think they're trapped in failure. They don't realize they've been feeding the wrong beast. Teach us this, Father. Today and Wednesday, teach it to us. May we be better for it. Bless this, Father, offering during this time. 
We thank you for that. Thank you for everything you give us, Father. We'll honor it. We'll spend it as wise as we know how to reach more people with the message of Christ. The gospel, categorical doctrine, in Jesus' name, amen.